being here and our pearls of kindness. We know many of our normal friends are traveling right now um, internationally and domestically, but we love all of you who have joined us who are traveling or at home. And we are here for session number 10 on Shalom Bayit, peace in the home. So let's start with a little poll to get ourselves uh, warmed up. I believe that peace in the home is central to all ethics and world peace, number one. Number two, peace in the home is important, but not as important as world peace and community building. Option three, people focus too much time on the home and the home needs to be decentralized. Okay, so where do you fall out here? Let's see how people vote. It's always hard to make a choice. Always hard to make a choice. Let's see what our results are. 33% say peace in the home is central to all ethics and world peace. 67% said peace in the home is important, but not as important as world peace. And no one answered that people spend too much time in the home. It needs to be centralized. Okay. So in our, in our chesed, in our kindness series, we are looking at ways that we can give our energy, our resources, our love um, to others. And our first 11 topics are the interpersonal realm um, in a certain dimension. And we are today looking at peace in the home. And I just want to say that some of this, like every topic, can be a little bit triggering because something I've learned as a rabbi is that virtually every one of us, in fact, I haven't met anyone yet who has not had conflict in the home, whether that was conflict in their childhood, conflict in their current home, um, recent, that some people hide it better than others. Um, but conflict in the home is. Um, not abnormal, it is the norm. And so that is all the more so why we have to continuously, every one of us in different ways, think about peace in the home. Uh, and for some of us that may be like the home we live in, and for me that just mean, that may just mean extended family, home in the sense of broader, broader family. So, um, so friends, let me just grab a pen because my pencil's not working. So, and I literally just got off a phone call as I typically do with someone sharing their enormous distress around peace in the home. Sometimes it's a parent-child relationship. Sometimes it's a spousal or partner relationship. Um, sometimes it's a sibling conflict. It is all the time, all the time. Okay, friends, in Jewish thought, the home is a holy place and the center of our lives, maintaining and preserving the integrity and sanctity of the home is of utmost importance. And the traditional reason for the importance of lighting Shabbat candles on Friday night was Shalom Bayit, peace in the home, referred to here in the Talmud as Shalom Beito. Here's what Rava said in Mesechet Shabbat. It is obvious to me that there is a fixed list of priorities when a person is poor and must choose between purchasing oil to light a Shabbat candle for their home or purchasing oil to light a Hanukkah lamp. The Shabbat lamp for their home takes precedence. This is due to peace in the home. Without the light of the lamp, their family would be sitting and eating their meals in the dark. Similarly, if there's a conflict between acquiring oil to light a lamp for their home and wine for Kiddush, the lamp for the home takes precedence due to peace in the home. Okay, so we see here limited resources. Somebody's in poverty. They can't afford both Hanukkah candles and Shabbat candles. Today, we think of poverty as like, oh, I can't buy the new iPhone, right? Like, oh my goodness, like I really want a new Mac, right? And I can't get a Mac. And I, I'm not diminishing that. It's just a very different sense of what we're talking about here in the Talmud. The Talmud's like, I can't buy a candle to light my home, right? And so I, I want to be clear that like there's different degrees of poverty, but just to put it in perspective a little bit. Like I literally have enough money to either buy a Hanukkah candles or Shabbat candles. Which one do I buy? And the Talmud is clear. You buy Shabbat candles over Hanukkah candles. Then it says, okay, so that's interesting. Shabbat over Hanukkah. But Shabbat, you can have wine or candles. Now, um, both of them are a way of 
bringing in Shabbat. You bring in Shabbat with Kiddush. You bring in Shabbat with the lighting of the candles. One of them you even get sustenance from. I mean, it's hard to call it sustenance, but maybe enjoyment. <laughs> enjoyment from the wine or the grape juice, right? Um, and yet, still, candles went out. Why? Peace in the home. Your family can't sit in the dark. Well, what does that mean today? We have electricity. Still, the candles are to inspire the sentiment of working on peace in the home. We enter Shabbat focused on that. So we may often have a desire to live our lives in a way that we believe to be authentic according to our own personal wishes and values. It's all about personal actualization, personal authenticity. But the rabbis teach us that the value of peace in the home matters so much that it can at times and should override our personal wishes. And beyond that, even take precedence over a mitzvah de Rabbanan, a rabbinic mitzvah, as in the passage mentioned above. Right? Hanukkah is a mitzvah de Rabbanan, a mitzvah of the rabbis. Bringing in Shabbat, a mitzvah of the Torah, right? And so we see um, that a, a rabbinic mitzvah is pushed off. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein wrote that one can shave during the Sephira period of mourning. Some uh, traditional Jewish men don't shave during the Sephira um, if his spouse feels strongly that he should shave for the sake of Shalom Bait. Now, one might say, what, wait a minute. They should have a respectful relationship. Let him do what he wants with his shaving. But they said, if your partner doesn't like hair on your face, right, even though it is a strong custom to not shave, you should shave for peace in the home, right? Doing something to adjust. Now that feels a little intrusive for a partner to say such a thing, but they want our partners to be happy. Rabbi Feinstein generally felt that one should refrain from shaving during this period absent a very compelling reason, such as a job interview where you have to be clean shaven. That is to say that he felt this was an example of a strong Jewish custom being overridden in, over, in order to keep peace in the home. The book of Proverbs teaches it is better to eat dry bread and live with peace than it is to enjoy a feast amidst contention. You probably heard of how high the divorce rates are for people who win the lottery. People are like, I won the lottery. I don't need you anymore, right? It's like, you know, um, like money was the answer to my problems. I was only with you because we were kind of poor. But now if I'm rich, like I don't need you, right? And so Proverbs is reminding us that like all of the comforts in the world can never stack up against having a supporting partner that without conflict in the home. The home is where we find comfort in oasis from the tribulations of the outside world, at least ideally. In the home that each of us inhabits, we feel as if everything is under our control, our domain, our mercy. It is prime spot for reflection and hopefully relaxation, but it's also another location to actualize holiness. We see the potentiality of the home writ large and the individual spot that each of us identifies as our home as well to act as a portal to another realm, a means by which mundanity becomes spiritual and the spiritual becomes tangible. Like any virtuous concept though, this one too can be misinterpreted. For example, some oppose divorce. They oppose divorce in the name of Shalom Bait. Why would you disrupt your spouse and your children by getting divorced, they say. However, this is an understanding, misunderstanding from the Jewish perspective. A home is built on love and trust and it would be a false peace to remain in a marriage where one or both partners were miserable and the relationship is irreparable. This is most certainly true in tragic cases of domestic violence. No one should ever suggest that peace in the home is the highest priority when one is at risk of violence or abuse. Bracketing extreme cases, we generally seek to work out conflicts in the home because everything of value can reside in it. As the soul is the domicile of the divine presence, our homes are manifestations of our dreams, our desires, and domestic needs. We must tend to them carefully while also keeping them open. The heart of a healthy home is boundless love that is nurtured within it. An unhappy home affects every aspect of a person's life, one's career, relationships, spiritual life, and even health. Therefore, the nature of home life must be one of positivity, 
even if, if one cannot always be expressed, if it cannot always be expressed to its fullest. So if a person must cut back on personal pleasures in order to help bring peace to the home, the emotional investment is often worthwhile. And so towards this end, many Russia yeshiva, spiritual heads of Jewish learning centers, may exempt and perhaps even require newlyweds, newly, newlyweds to remain at home with their spouses during the late night learning seder, the study hour for the first year of marriage as the foundation of home infused with shalom bayit begins with partners being there for one another. The rabbis taught that the Torah allows for the erasure of the holy name of God, right? Which is a big chilo Hashem, desecration of the name of God, in order to restore peace in the home. This comes from the Sota story. One can nullify a vow that can normally not be nullified if it can further shalom bayit. The rabbis teach that God even lied, so to speak, to preserve shalom bayit in the home of Abraham and Sarah. This comes from um, um, this comes from uh, Masechet Yavamot. It was taught in the school of Rabbi Yishmael, great is peace as even the Holy One be blessed, departed from truth for it. As initially it is written that Sarah said of Abraham, and my Lord is old. And in the end, it is written that God told Abraham and Sarah, and I am old. God adjusted Sarah's words in order to spare Abraham hurt feelings that might lead Abraham and Sarah to quarrel. And so um, we see here God bracketing truth to help to maintain peace in the family. We're also told in Pirkei Avot, be like the students of our own, loving peace and pursuing peace, loving all creatures and returning them to the Torah. We know that Moshe is known for emet, for the value of truth, and our own is known for the value, value of shalom, of peace. Rev Avadia of Bartanura comments on these words, that if two people were in an argument, our own would tell each of them privately that the other one felt badly and wished to be forgiven, thereby repairing the relationship between them. He would lie to each party to help to bring them back together. Rabbi Yisrael Iserlin, um, who was a 15th century German Talmudic scholar, best known for his work, Truma Tadeshin, comments, comments on these words that if two people were in an argument, Aaron would tell each of them privately. Excuse me. He taught that certain mitzvot, such as having more children, are superseded by the desire to have a peaceful family. For example, if one partner wants more children and the other does not, right? that the value of shalom by a peace in the home should outweigh the, this desire to have more. When a couple gets married, we give them the blessing that they should build a bayit ne'eman b'Yisrael, a faithful, enduring Jewish home. We hope they will work through tensions and disagreements in order to find peace and happiness together. And indeed, this is our task toward kindness, to help relieve the tensions of families around us to keep them happily together. We don't ideally want divorce or children removed to become foster children. We want, we want when safe and fruitful for families to remain together. The Talmud teaches that when there is divorce, the holy altar sheds tears. The Talmud also teaches that divorce is really difficult. Just the process of divorce itself can be expensive exhausting, infuriating, divisive, and lonely, not to mention the challenges of divorce life after the divorce has been complete for the partners and for the children. Further, we know that the children, as mentioned, of divorced parents will suffer and have increased risks, severe increased risks in, um, in the long-term long success. Rabbi Yonah Rice, the current Av Beit Din of the Chicago Rabbinical Council, however, reminds us that if it is clear to abate in that the marriage cannot be saved, it is incumbent upon each party to cooperate with respect to a get at the request of the other party. Just a reminder that yes, there is secular divorce, but Jews in, embrace gitin, a, a Jewish divorce process. One cannot remarry without a Jewish divorce called a get. And it is 
one may not deny the get to their partner. They can't say, oh, I wanna see how custody hearings play out. I wanna see how our secular battle over finances are gonna play out. If one wants a get, they get a get. And the court has to support that. Peace in the home also intersects with public security. Consider this teaching in the Torah. When you build a new house, you shall make a railing for your roof so that you do not bring blood on your house if anyone should fall from it. This is a biblical mitzvah to have a fence on the roof to make sure nobody falls off the roof for the sake of peace in the home. One must turn their home and their property into a peaceful place by ensuring it cannot cause harm to others. You may not own a dog that bites people. If your dog is gonna hurt people, hurt people you gotta put the dog to sleep or have major protections to make sure your dog never bites anyone. This verse is applied to owning a violent pet. Here, as I mentioned, here it says in Bava Kama. Rav Natan says, from where is it derived that one may not raise a vicious dog in their house and that one may not set up an unstable ladder in their home? As it is stated, you shall not bring blood on your house, as we just said from Deuteronomy, which means what, that one may not allow a hazardous situation to remain in the house. Shalom Bayit then is as much about physical safety as it is about spiritual and emotional security. One could easily extend this commitment to gun safety in our day, given the countless needless deaths from gun violence, not only in society, but even in the home. And so while Shalom Bayit is primarily about maintaining a joyful, respectful home with one's family, it should also inspire us to be sure that our home is peaceful and safe for those who enter it internally or encounter it externally. Lastly, we are of course taking for granted here that we're dealing with a situation in which there is a home at all. When there is no physical home to speak of, we must all the more so do all we can to ensure that others, the homeless, foster children, refugees and the like, have homes that can, they can turn in, that can, they, they can in turn make peaceful. May we dream of a day where everyone has a home to rest and thrive in and that these homes emanate a peace that transforms our communities and societies at large. Okay, friends, lots to unpack here together. I would love to hear from you. Thank you, Eddie, for managing that. I'd love to hear from you all. Let's go to, um, let's go to the, 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 um, the gallery uh, view. There we go. Beautiful. Okay, friends, love to hear from you. Hi. 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 Okay. <laughs> I'm always the first one to say something. No, nope, sometimes Lauren, you and Lauren are, we'll say, uh, you know, we got a little contest there. <laughs> Good contest. Okay. It's the teacher and me. You know, I know great, the class great. discussions don't do anything, but anyway. All right. So I'm the product of a very volatile divorce, a very, 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 very volatile divorce and everything, though. So, long story short, recently I had to, I, I had some friends who decided to get a divorce and their 12 year old daughter, they were asking me, you know, what my perspective was because there was no precedent for divorce in their family. Um, how do I put this? Um, I actually ended up explaining to them that um, children of divorced families also, there are good things that do happen. For instance, um, independence. Um, I found myself to be a lot more independent at a much younger age because of the fact that, well, sometimes life doesn't turn out the way that you planned. Okay, so I don't know if there's anything, you know, anything to comment upon that. Great, great. So, so Aglaia, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't mm -hmm. think what you're saying is that di that divorce is fundamentally a good thing. I no. think what you're saying is and not without giving yourself credit and being modest, is that you are a person of resiliency and that you found the divorce that you encountered to be one that ultimately you embraced as a, as a strengthening process in your own life. I yeah. think it's more a tribute to you than it is to the divorce process itself. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to agree with that. You don't have to agree with that. <laughs> and more a tribute to basically all of my friends who were came from divorced families also. We were kind of, um, I'd rather not listen to these two idiot adults anymore. Sorry oh, to say the word idiot in front oh, of a rabbi, That's another point, right. So your point there that a child is gonna thrive more 
Mm-hmm. With, um, in, at, in a divorce than in a contentious home. I completely right. agree with that point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that I know so many people who were raised by single mothers or the like who really thrived. And that doesn't mean that we should have a world of only single mothers raising children. It just means that like humans are really resilient. And mm-hmm. sometimes people have learned under difficult situations to really thrive. But I completely agree with your point that in irreparable conflicts, a child is going to thrive more in a home Mm-hmm. without those conflicts. So thank you for sharing that that important point. Hi, Lauren. Um, Hi, something similar. Um, yeah. To grow up in a home where one parent is very abru- abusive and the other one is actually also afraid of the abusive spouse, yeah. um, it's just devastating. Right. And, you know, I grew up in a time when divorce was almost unheard of. You know, in the 50s, 60s, who got divorced? It was very unusual. But, you know, and also knowing some friends of mine who grew up in that kind of situation where like one parent was great and the other parent was extremely abusive, it would be so much better for the marriage to just dissolve, um, to save the child. It really, um, and sometimes, you know, divorce can be a godsend. Yeah, Sometimes, yeah. no matter how bad things are, I think I, I could still be married. Life could be worse. Right. So it is all that's too my... common. Thank you, Lauren. It is all too common that, uh, well, there's obviously homes that have two abusive parents, but where there's only one and the other just allows it and goes with it um, for various reasons and would serve themselves and the ch- children better um, to part ways. Um, but they feel locked in that relationship for various reasons. And so Judaism has, has never been anti-divorce, um, has very much on a biblical level ensured that there is a pathway towards divorce and embrace the dignity and necessity of that. We, we still say it's tragic. It's kind of like in a similar but very different way. Judaism hates abortion. Like abortion is a bad thing, but of course we have to allow for a pathway for abortion, right? that there's so many cases where abortion is the right choice. It's still a tragic thing to abort a fetus, even if it's the right moral choice to make in many cases, just like it's tragic to have a divorce, even when it's the right thing to do. Um, and so it's kind of a similar case where we call it in, in Hebrew, in, in, in Jewish talk, bidi evet. Like the bidi evet is, oh, we don't want this to happen, but it is the right choice to happen to make among imperfect choices, right? And so thank you for that, Lauren. Hi, Eddie. So then uh, what is uh, Judaism's view on unconditional love then? So I I don't think unconditional love is a real thing in Judaism because it should be conditioned. Yes. Um, Yeah, so let's think about that together because that's a really important point. So I um, I think what most people mean by unconditional love, tell me if you have a different understanding, is that um, that I, um, I love you regardless of how you love me, regardless of how you treat me. Um, I think that the only, the, the, the model that might be closest to this, I think are two, are two types. One is the, a parent's relationship with a child. There are many parents that even if their child has really disrespected them, um, so deeply that they can never remove that level of love, especially a mother who gave birth to a child or, or the like. Um, I think that's one type we experience on kind of a biological level. And I think the other type is God. Um, I think there are people who don't believe that God does anything for them, um, that God actually is present or helping them, but they still believe in some abstract notion of divinity. And even though they don't receive anything in their theology, they still feel a gratitude towards their creator and a sense that I have this love for this being that gave me life, even if they continue to give me nothing. And so I think those are the two closest models to unconditional love, a sense of a divine human relationship and a parental relationship with a child. But if we look at the other version, how a child views a parent or a spousal relationship, I think the notion that like, I'm going to inevitably love you regardless of how you treat me feels not only impossible, 
but maybe even irresponsible to kind of love without condition. The only other thing I'd say before I want to open up other people's thoughts on this is that uh, we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that love is unidimensional. There's one type of love. It may be that there's a certain type of love with other human beings that is unconditional and another type that is not. Like, I love you for your core, even if I don't love you for your choices. It's kind of like, I want to divorce you because I don't love you as a, as a partner anymore but I still have a certain type of love for you, even though I want to divorce you because we have such a shared history. I know so many people have been divorced who are like, I hate you and I never want to live with you or even see you again. But I have to be honest, there's still a part of me that has a certain type of love for you that I'm going to cry when you die. I'm going to like be sad if you're hurting. Even I, even I, I might feel some joy because I hate you, but I also feel like, love is complicated. And so too with a parent child, like, I hate you, like you've mistreated me, but there's still something there. And so hate and love can coexist in one relationship. So this is complicated. So I'd love to hear from Aglaia and, and others. And, and Eddie, we'll circle back to you since you raised the question. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to throw in there, like, um, ultimately, though, aren't we all supposed to love each other on that level anyway, though? Like, I mean, I mean, a person might have done something, you know, but still, you don't want harm to come to them. So because of that, though, there is a generalized kind of love that all humans should have for each other anyway. So I don't know um, if that is part great, of it. Great. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder what we mean by that. When, Like when we talk about the Ahavta L'Riach kamocha, loving our fellow, biblical mitzvah, loving our fellow like ourselves, right? Now, what's interesting about Jews, Jewish history, predominantly understands this type of love as a behavior, not an emotion. That means I have normative obligations. Not that I see a stranger in the street and I have to feel some emotional love to them. It means that I have a certain level of moral obligations to all human beings, not to harm them, to have a general concern for welfare. You know, that doesn't mean that I have to like, um, you know, just have a certain feeling. Like you can't command emotions. How can you command an emotion? Emotion's not in our control. We may be able to influence our emotions, but we don't can't control them. If anyone's ever tried that, you know that. Um, and so, um, so yeah. So that's kind of interesting. I think a more Christian version uh, of love, uh, and that's, this is not me dismissing it, just kind of differentiating. I think there is some expectation of universal love, as if I'm going to. But I would argue that that's flawed. Um, I would argue that that's a flawed approach. And I think the history of blood on the church's hands, um, you know, is a good is a good example to show. Like, what do you mean, like universal love? Like, do you mean only for people who believe Christ is their savior? And then, you know, throughout history, you don't want to get the history people, teacher started. Don't get me started. Also. Don't get me started. Also. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not. I'm not saying anything to diminish Christians or Christianity. Um, I'm only kind of blaming the violent kind of, you know, churches throughout history, of which there's no lack of them. But I think that we see here, like, when a theology can have that much blood on its hands, I think we have to kind of question what's happening. Hi, Toby. Let's hear from Toby. I want to change the subject completely and Arrange, talk about arranged marriages, okay? Pre you said pre-arranged marriages? Yeah, well, I was speaking with a friend of mine who is a devout Hindu in India, and he is in the process of having his parents select for him an appropriate mate. And I know that in uh, certain forms of Judaism, that is still a common practice. And his, uh, he had a lot of statistics. We got into it about that. And he had a lot of statistics. And at least as far as India is concerned, there is a proportion of devout Hindus who still practice arranged marriages. And his, his statistics demonstrated that the divorce rate or the separation rate was so much lower for people who were involved in uh, arranged marriages. And um, he had several reasons for that or several explanations for that. His parents are both university teachers. He's not a stupid guy. Mm -hmm. He has a master's degree in finance. I mean, we're not talking about somebody who has no clue here. But I was curious as to what your, what your sense and anybody else's sense of that was. Great, great. So 
Um, I think we're going to take for granted that as modern people, none of us have any interest in, in arranged marriages in our lives, nor do we experience them in our immediate social circles. And yet, Aglaia, we're going to channel the relativism here. And yet, like, it is worth thinking about, as Toby flags to us, like in India and in the ultra-Orthodox world, like, what are some of the, well, let's, 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 let's take for granted there are problems with that, but what are some of the advantages of such a system? If you look at the modern person and how we engage in dating apps, we have so many desires and needs. We want someone with similar values, similar lifestyle. We want to be attracted to them. We want to have similar political worldviews. We want to have similar religious worldviews. We want to have similar lifestyles of how we want to spend our time. We want someone to be of a similar age range in a similar location. I mean, and then we want chemistry. We want to connect. Right. And, you know, and then we know, even if all that is there and something just doesn't feel right in our gut, I'll go to the next one. Now, that's not me critiquing that. It's just a part of our modern predicament. It's like walking into the grocery store and you've got 50 different kinds of seltzer and 70 you know, types of cereal boxes and 30 types of laundry detergent. We are like paralyzed and in, to some degree with just an, an, an enormous amount of choice of choice. And this is a, this is a very modern phenomenon to live in every aspect of our lives with the privileges of choices. Now, not everyone has the same choices. You know, President, former President Obama said, he said, at some point I said, don't ask me what color tie I wanna to wear today. I have so many hard choices to make today that I want somebody else to make all my little choices. Like decide what I'm eating for breakfast, decide what color tie I'm wearing. Like I gotta decide like about a war, about like interest rates, you know, and things like this, you know? And so, and so, um, and so I think to enter this, conversation about um, fixed marriages, I think when the assumption is that physical attraction is not my main goal in a partner, and of course we're going to have the same shared values and the same shared lifestyle, right? The only issue is like, are we of the right age? Do our families kind of get along? Because it's not just about us, it's about a, a broader system. Um, and um, are we you know, gonna live in the same town here? Like it, it, they wanna make the process easier. And so they say like, why would we embrace some weird dating process when like, it's not about chemistry. Like the, the, the phrase they say in the ultra Orthodox world all the time is love comes after marriage, which as modern people is absurd. Like we're like, what do you mean? What do you mean you fall in love and then you marry someone you're in love with? They say, that makes no sense. Like, first of all, you're not going to have any physical intimacy until after you're married. And so you're going to marry them. Then you're going to be physically intimate for the first time in your life. And then you're going to fall in love. Now, what happens if you don't? And, and their answer is, it doesn't matter. You're committed to a certain lifestyle that even if you're not in love with this person, who cares? That's such a modern idea. Remember Fiddler on the Roof? Part of the predicament of Fiddler on the Roof is... Um, that she, um, that he is becoming modern. And he says to his wife, but do you love me, right? Do you love me? And she says, what do you mean do I love you? I iron your clothes. I mean, you didn't iron clothes back in the day. I make you dinner. I like make your bed. You're like, I raised your children. What do you mean do I love you? And then he's like, no, no, but do you love me? He wants to know as he's like emerging in this new era that she feels something for him. And she's like, I don't understand what you're talking about. I do everything you want. Like, why do you want me to feel something? She can't understand him, right? Because she assumes that like, they have a lifestyle where they take care of each other and that's what love means. But he wants to know that she actually feels something for him. So anyways, I would love to hear others thoughts on this. Yes, Aglaia, I see your hand up. Okay, um, just so I wanna throw this out there just as a concept. Okay, just because, well, I have to, I can't resist. Um, historically, marriage, like you're talking about marriage, um, what exactly is marriage about? So in arranged marriage situations, they might not even have the same idea, definition of marriage that we had. For most of history, marriage was an economic arrangement, period. So what, you know, for us, though, it's like, oh, yeah, you're supposed to, you know, I'm supposed to have everything I want. Well, people in hell want ice water. That's what I usually tell people. So anyway, but yeah, um, it, cause I, and also um, in those societies, how stigmatized are divorces? And that's why when I've heard some of these little younger 
you know, millennial kind of people saying, oh, I want an arranged marriage because it's going to last so much longer. And we're going to be so not exactly, not exactly. So look, I listen to young people all day long. Okay. So, but the issue that I'm kind of noticing though, is that, well, how do you exactly define a marriage anyway? Great. Does great. Yeah. So Aglaia is exactly right that the financial interests of the families involved was a big part of what was going on there. This was an economic arrangement and uh, more than, um, uh, and um, a chance to ensure to maximize, you know, the building of the tribe and building of the family and have as many children as possible. And these women were expected to like pump out a dozen kids, you know, um, that as soon as her, her period returned, as soon as her menstruation cycle got back to a point where she had fertility, like she needs to be putting out a baby and like, you got to max out every chance, you know? And boy, I mean, the, the, the strain on these women's bodies, um, not to mention prior to having ultrasounds, the, uh, the level of risks on these women, these women experience having these, this number of, the number of women, women who died. I mean, today in the global South still, but like my wife, if we had had a baby at a certain point, because we had an ultrasound that prevented it, if we had done that, like she, God forbid, would have died. And that, that happened throughout history. And so um, you're exactly right. And I, I do still know people today who are like, I don't really want to get married, but like we get some tax benefits. So let's do that. You know what I mean? And that feels like, I, I guess I get it. Like, it feels a little sad to be like, we're going to marry for that. But that's also the history of the world. Like what people were doing, you know? So you're exactly right. You're exactly, you're exactly right. Yes. Hi, Eric. Rabbi Shmuley, thank you so much on this on this topic. This has been very fascinating. And just to give a little context, I've got a question, but also some context. I grew up in a household where uh, peace in the family was not uh, was not even respected. It was actually truth uh, would lead to peace in the family because everyone there would be complete, absolute truth would lead to uh, peace in the family, which um, I think we know from life that's necessarily that is not necessarily true. Uh, the question I have um, that we, that I don't think I've heard, but I love to get people's perspectives on this, is the concept of peace in the family that goes beyond the traditional uh, concepts. When we talked about house, we talked about the participants in the house and the peace of it. But I've also seen examples where peace in the house has gone, has transcended beyond the original concept to extend uh, where the home is. And home isn't just the house. The home could be one synagogue. One could be one's a local community. Home could be um, no longer just the house itself. So I'm wondering where have we seen, I'll get your perspectives on that concept, transcending the traditional text where peace in the home has gone, uh, it's been played to different, um, beyond, again, just I, those are examples. I get people's thoughts on that. Great. Anybody want to, want to respond to it before I do? Great. So, um, so um, yeah, yeah, Eddie. I kind of feel that in the way, like think about it when you're going on a road trip with your spouse, mm -hmm. you might be stuck in, in the car for, you know, lots of hours. You want to make sure that there's peace in that car because it's going to be really awkward to be angry with each other for the entire ride. So then right there, it becomes a priority to have peace in the house. Uh, let's say there's an argument on food or stopping somewhere um, for the sake of, of peace in, in the house, I'd say, you know, you would hope that up as a priority. Awesome. So, yeah, so that's interesting to kind of play with this idea because the phrase in, in, in tradition is not shalom mishpacha. It's not peace in the family. It is shalom bayit, peace in the home. And that's interesting to think about. It's almost like there's, there can be a little bit more tolerance for conflict when it's outside of the physical structure of house or home, because there ought to be some place in everyone's life where people feel safe. And that we call the physical structure of home. And so, um, yes, as Eric suggests, this does get extended. Like it gets extended to extended family. It gets extended as Eddie's saying on a road trip. And yet, um, because it's called Shalom Bayit, not Shalom Mishpacha, we say like, how when I walk into the walls of this place, are there different norms that exist here, right? And I think part of the reason of thinking of it that way is that there's a whole lot to do to manage a home. You got to buy food, 
you got to do laundry, you got to pay the bills, right? It is really hard work. And if you have a partner and one is going to do more than the other, and then kids are going to make a mess, right? And then what if you have an elderly parent who needs to live with you? Um, you know, you're, you're a caregiver <clears throat> um, and you have guests. And so like this focus on bite, on home itself, is to ensure that we all have that stability of a home. Now, that's not to say, like, it's almost like I know some people who say we keep kosher in the home, which is to say, like, <clears throat> yes, we value kosher, but I do it differently outside the home than in the home, because the home has a level of sanctity to me that's a little bit different. So, too, I would never su suggest if somebody's going to fight, they should, like, go into their backyard to fight, because that might scare the neighbors, right? But there is something interesting to that, to be like, well, how does this home, like, maintain a certain sense of safety and kind of calm? in a way that would be different outside the home. So it's an interesting thing that Eric and Eddie flagged there. Can I just yes. jump in again before yes. I annoy people too much? No, okay. you're not trying to be annoying. Okay, no. um, in my particular case, so just to throw this out there, um, home, um, long story short, I was one of those people who was afflicted with the wanderlust issue, like from day one of my life and everything. Um, I went back, okay, one of my friends has, mom died and I went back to visit him in Williamsburg because um, we went to William and Mary together. And I was in the car driving from Richmond to Williamsburg. And before I could help myself, it said College of William and Mary ahead on a sign. And I thought home immediately before I could help myself. So then it kept happening. So it was like, well, it, I, I have a home even though I never actually really wanted to, but home can actually mean even your undergraduate institution as, as far as I'm concerned, so. Awesome, thank you for that. And that also moves me down an interesting trajectory as well. Last year I read um, a, uh, this great book by, um, and, Eddie and I, Eddie and I talked about it quite a bit, by Lama Rod Owens, who is a uh, black queer Buddhist man. And he writes about rage and he writes about the rage as a black man growing up in America that he experienced and how he has these spiritual practices to engage in this rage. And one of the spiritual practices he offers, which I've embraced since reading this, is about homecomings. He says home is an internal state, right? That yes, home might mean like these tchotchkes you have around, like maybe you have something you inherited from your parents. It may mean like the home you, you, you know, that you walk into. But he says the deepest sense of home are these homecomings internally that we return to. And um, that each of us needs to have a spiritual practice where we have the deepest comfort by going into those internal places. They may be memories that bring us comfort. They may be um, kind of feelings or emotional states we want to return to. He says like your, your physical home is gonna change. Your, the stuff around you is gonna change, but that internal homecoming you can go to whenever you need. And that's sort of interesting, this notion of shalom bayit, not only as an external manifestation, but also as an internal manifestation of our own spiritual uh, practice. Um, and that's also helpful because when we need to go to our internal home, we can go there when needed. And I'll tell you a time like when I went there, and I'm sure we all have cases like this, but I had to go inside, um, I don't think it's called an MRI machine. What do you call the long tube that you have to lay in that you can't move in while they do your scan? Is it an MRI? MRI. MRI. So I'm like claustrophobic and I um, was terrified being in this tube for like a half hour. And not only like being in there, but like not being able to move. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to survive this because if I if I hit if I if I tell them to take me out, they're just going to wait till I, I can try again because they have to do this. Uh, yeah, and the noise too. And so I'm so scared in this machine, and I'm like, I got to figure out this internal home I'm going to go to. I need to bring my consciousness to a new place because, they, and I, I know we all have things like that that we have to actually leave our physical space. Um, we have to actually leave our consciousness from our physical space. Or imagine you have a nightmare. We all have nightmares, not only as kids but as adults. You wake up in the night and you can't return to sleep. Like, how do you return to that internal homecoming? Yes, Eddie. Yeah, it reminded me of a concept that my mom used to do of, of grounding home. Um, I moved, unfortunately, because my mom and I were undocumented. We had to move a lot. 
Um, and I moved every single year of my school year in elementary school, every single year I moved. Uh, and one of the most important things that my mom did to every new uh, place that we moved into, the number one first, first thing she would do is set up pictures. She would set up pictures of our family and like in the very front so that anytime we came in, even if like we hadn't finished putting away the dishes or something, the one constant, no matter what, was that we would always see that our pictures of our family and us was always first. That was always the, the consistent thing. Um, and then um, what also reminded me of when you said, uh, you, you talked about Lama Rod Owens, um, that homecoming, uh, something that my mom would always do is that if we ever had to leave the house or like go visit a family member or something, she, we had a custom to deep clean the house before we left and come back to a very, very clean house to kind of ground you back into your home, to like welcome yourself back into that home. And I think that that may be a spiritual practice that we do. And it also kind of gives me hints of Shabbat, of the grounding of Shabbat and what that brings in. Great, great. I love that. Thank you for all of that. Wow. And yeah, th there we see actually the mitzvah to clean the home for Shabbat also is is that that sense so let's say the opposite now we focus on the internal homecoming of homecoming but also i think we can all rethink um maybe maybe you already have a practice on this how to restructure our physical living space so that it's actually bringing us peace sometimes we get into a rut or a routine that we have just the same art for decades the same color carpet the same um everything and maybe that's because we financially don't don't have the wiggle room to make any adjustments, or maybe we just haven't rethought it. But maybe we can rethink like, let me actually meditate on each part of my home, and like, is it actually bringing me peace physically? The things around me. Do I need to get rid of some stuff? You know, there's all this literature today that people love. I've never read it around. Does this stuff bring me joy? And get rid of the stuff that doesn't bring me joy. To rethink of the clothes and rethink of the, you know. But also, does this bring me peace? You know. Um, not that it should move us to vanity, that like we should only own things that like uh, bring us actualization. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff we can own that doesn't have to invoke a deep sense of spiritual peace, right? Like your milk carton, you know, or your garbage can, right? But in general, like this is really important that we have peace and, and there's a psychological dimension, there's a spiritual dimension, there's a physical dimension. Yes, hi, Lauren, and then to uh, Toby. Uh, yeah, Lauren, and then Toby. Yeah, okay. Oh, I think it's about the garbage can. I, I, I had my oh, history sorry. done um, a, about three years ago. And the only thing, and I had to hire a contractor in the home. I mean, it was the big thing. And uh, the only thing I told them is, look, dude, I have to have no visible garbage can. I, I, you know, one of those drawers that pull out. And to this day, every time I open the stupid garbage can, it's a religious moment. Yeah. It's yeah. like a spiritual, it's <laughs> like, you know what? I love this. I loved it three years ago. I love it every time I open it up. It's not seeing the junk. Yeah, totally. Totally. And so what, what Toby's flagging here is really important that like we, I, I know the behavioral economists want to want to suggest that humans are totally rational beings and totally predictable in our behaviors, or actually in some ways irrational because we're so predictable. Um, but actually like there's a whole bunch of human behavior that is completely irrational, of course, and even though it is predictable. And so like there's, we have a lot of preferences of what we find attractive, of what we find comfortable, of what we find peaceful that we don't need to be able to justify or explain. It's just who we are. And if it's something like, I don't wanna see a garbage can or I, I like this color, like why do we like certain colors over other colors? Right, it's, there are deep parts of our DNA, deep parts of our early childhood experiences, deep parts of human preference, and we can validate those. Yeah, so thanks for that example, Toby, that's cool. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, two things quickly. So one in, in so adding on to what Eddie said, uh, cause I've moved a lot and every time the pictures get up on the wall, yeah. man, that's home. And, um, you know, I live alone and even from like when I was married, I still for myself, planning for Shabbat starts on Wednesday and Friday, you know, the home feels like Shabbat. Even if I don't have family, it's me, it's home. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was just thinking about Shalom Bayi, we can actually 
transfer it to friendships. Yes. Because, you know, I've, I've had times when, you know, it feels terrible when you're in conflict with friends. Mm -hmm. So there's a time when you have to know when to say nothing, mm -hmm. when to contract yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but really, there's a lot that goes into Shalom Bayit that we put into mm -hmm. maintaining friendships. Beautiful. And I think that they, they become like family. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and that's interesting. So if we think of Bayit, not as an objective place, but as a subjective interrelational space, almost like in any space of friendship, we can create bait between us, right? That in any space, it is um, um, an interspatial reality. Um, that if I go to coffee with a friend or to lunch, like that table can become bait. That can become a sense of home because we create a safe space together where we can reside um, together. And so um, that's a really cool way to think of that. And so it might mean bringing a friend into our home, our physical home, or it might mean that we create a certain friendship that feels so safe um, and, and respectful that when we're together, we have bite. So thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Francine, do you want to jump in at all or Eric or Yehuda? I actually think that last concept is, is really uh, I do agree with it that, that we're talking about the the conceptual change of that from just the location, but also the contextual from the friends and individuals are the composition of uh, of that shown by it. and it's going transcending the, the physical to where there's there's a combination of the physical and the conceptual of the friendships or create that sense of peace and and, mm -hmm. and what we have. Um, what I'm I'm kind of curious, Rabbi, is. Uh, are there leading scholars that kind of advocated the notion that Shalom Bayit is trans is kind of in modern times where we're moving past the traditional way of looking at it, and because now we have the ability to travel more, people will like you know the diaspora is bigger. So while we have you know the physical home, but also we have the you know people in yeshiva and seminaries, universities, you know there are temporary homes that are not the same as the. So I'm wondering if the, where there's been scholars that you think that are kind of the cutting edge to on the concept of Shalom Bites and where we're looking at a new perspective of it or we're taking a more modern twist to it. Yeah, 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 thank you for that. Well, you know, it's also an interesting reminder picking up on your previous comment as well, Eric, that what do we call the temple in Yerushalayim that many um, Jews, you know, pray for the return of? We call it, um, we call it a bite, right? Um, um, we call it Beit Hamikdash, right? Just like a shul is a Beit Knesset. Um, and where are we right now? We're at Beit Midrash, a house of study, right? Beit is Beit. Um, that is a reminder that the home is, one type of home is where we reside, but we're not only supposed to reside in the place we sleep at, we're supposed to reside in the house of study. We are right now in a bite. When we go to pray, we are in a bite. When we have a central national bite shlishi, a third temple, that is a place for, for as a nation for us to be together. So the notion of bite is um, is is expansive, just like we said between friendship, but also between community. And here, I mean, I, I, I hope that we feel when we come together every Tuesday at this time, that we are entering a bite together, a space where we can share ideas. Nobody's going to judge or critique one another. We're gonna share different perspectives and have a, have a place of learning and that's a bite. And, um, um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, and as Eric is saying here, like there is a traditional no notion of kind of shalom bite. Uh, which in some ways is conflict averse. And then in some ways today, a notion that a house is built upon disagreement. It's built upon um, different ideas. It's built upon the reality um, that we w wish to embrace, e even when it's not totally comfortable. And so, Eric, I don't know if I touched on your specific question there, though. Thank you. No, that, no this is okay. The, th thank you so much for providing your, um, your thoughts on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I can just say when it comes to um, bite also, um, that actually was the reason why I 
thought William and Mary was home. It, it, we had our problems and everything. It's not like, but it's different when you're talking about, are we all family or is this just our safe space to basically be a bunch of teenagers who want to pretend like we're intelligent? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. I mean, and that's kind of an interesting thing also, touching on what you're looking at. Looking at child development and the different stages of development psychologically, looking at Piaget and everything post Piaget around a child's development, we forget to look at adult development. We think that the development is for children, but the whole field of adult development looks at these various spheres throughout our lives, right? Young adults from 18 to 25, and then 25 to 35, and then there's this other stage, and then there's the 55 to 65, and then there's 65 to 75, and it's arbitrary as I'm creating these decades. But adult development is ongoing. And yet, we, as our brain is maturing and developing, um, we forget that it only makes sense that our relationship to everything around us is shifting, our relationship to religion, to family, to home. And sometimes we have to change a whole lot of things to accommodate that development. We're not supposed to be at age 80, the same person we were at 60, right? At 60, the person we were at 40, most certainly 20 as we were 10. And, um, and that's almost surprising to us. Why do I not get the same joy out of the same things? Because we need to evolve, right? And so to find peace in the home, it's going to require a whole different set of tools when I'm 75 from when I'm 45. Um, and so, yeah, in college, it's such a unique experience that a college student is like, wow, I have all this independence. I don't live with a parent. I can like, you know, um, I have to like make my dorm room what I want. And <laughs> And, and sadly, many college students are making their dorm room what looks kind of socially cool. I'm going to put up a poster that's popular. I'm going to like decorate it in a way that's so, and they never actually say, like, ask themselves, what is my own intentionality of how like I want my living space to feel for me? They don't have the maturity to necessarily do that yet, right? Or they join a fraternity or a sorority, or they become a fan of their, their college sports team, right? And that becomes their bite. They're craving community. They're craving identity. And um, it's such a confusing time, um, such a confusing time in life. Um, uh, but then again, w um, I'm not sure which stage of life is not confusing. So, That's which, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if we're not confused, maybe we're doing it wrong. Maybe we, have, we need to shake things up a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, so friends, um, next week, we're looking at Hidur Panay Zakain. We're looking at um, respecting the, uh, the elderly um, in the most broad sense of how we understand that. That's gonna be our topic next week. And I hope you'll join us as we continue along our path of furthering kindness in the world. I hope we'll think today about Shalom Bayit and think not only how to add more peace into our internal home, our personal space we live in, the, the Bayit we create with other people in the Beit Midrash, the Beit Knesset, the, the, the Beit Cafe, the house, the coffee house, um, but also in um, um, the, the homes of others as we seek to for, help them achieve peace in their own lives as well. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much. God bless.